foliage crops. We used to teach a class in uh, interior plants, interior plants, but uh, we had to cut back on courses a long time ago, and so this is it. Um, so first thing we talk about interior plants and foliage plants, and I, I like to include it in, in part of here because it is a, a major part of our industry. The first thing I like to say is there's no such thing as a house plant. Everybody has house plants, but there's really no such thing. They're, they're typically native to a tropical or, or arid region and inside my house. Inside your house. <laughs> uh, and so we expect our foliage plants to adapt to typically um, less than ideal conditions. Our homes, our offices is often very much less than ideal. They're either way too dry, way too hot, way too cold. And the challenge is to get to know the plant's environmental needs and to meet those so that we can have good maintenance practice and good production practices to uh, grow those plants. So we have a lot of different uh, types of things that we say uh, we typically call them foliage plants. And what is a foliage plant? A foliage plant is any plant that we're growing for pretty leaves. Uh, we want them to look good. We want them to look nice. Uh, we're using them for interior decoration, interior landscape purposes. Um, and most of the foliage plants that are growing flowers are typically secondary. Um, we're looking at herbaceous plants. We're looking at woody plants, uh, tree forms. They can be monocots, dicots, and they can be ferns. Oh, there's a new fern out. It's just been named. Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga. Gaga fern, and uh, it's why, why? <laughs> it's, be, it's because the, the there's two species so far. It's because the 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 gametophyte stage, which is the sexual, excuse me, the gametophyte stage, uh, actually looks like one of her costumes, and um, and also the DNA sequence has got got a repeat structure of G A G A G A G A, Gaga. <laughs> You think I'm kidding? <laughs> You're just making this up. I read the article. You read. All, the, all the artists in the world. And it has to be her. She named herself after one of Queen's songs, okay? Like. Oh, I do know that song. Yeah. Okay, so all right. radio got it. All right. Come on. <laughs> I like Queen better, though. Anyway, <laughs> I'll put a link on the website for Lady Gaga Fern. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, Thank you, Cody, <laughs> for knowing that. <laughs> <laughs> Foliage production in the continental United States is primarily focused in uh, Florida, California, and Texas. And why is it there? It's because uh, they can do a lot of the production outside in shade houses or you know, reduced uh, moderate winter, winter temperatures. They got high light typically throughout the year. And uh, it, uh, they're easy to ship. Uh, th th we can ship them just about any truck. Um, the northern areas, if you're going to grow, uh, some people will grow their own materials. What they'll do is they'll br bring in smaller materials and, and bump it up uh, if they have access to a local market and maintaining uh, easy grow and whether or not you're generating rapid turnover. So you see, Florida has the largest um, of the two, uh, California, uh, Southern California primarily, and Texas in the uh, McAllen, Texas area is is a strong contender but a lot of that shipping is strictly on the gulf coast um, so where is the production um, as you can see is florida primarily um, california hawaii um, wholesale value um, hawaii's got a good good amount but a lot of it stays in hawaii the product mix memorize this Product mix? No, don't. Uh, the largest group of uh, in the product mix are philodendron species. The next jumps to the dracaenas, the palms, and the ficus and Daphnebachia, and the rest of it is just uh, pretty much a snapshot. Uh, a lot of syngoniums um, uh, of different materials. So, but the biggest product mix in the foliage market is in the philodendron, the dracaenas, and the palms. So they're, they're native to tropical and subtropical regions. I mean, when I was a graduate student growing my own house plants and foliage plants, no house plants, there's no such thing. Uh, my friends 
the international students, especially from Africa, come over and say, why are you growing weeds in your house? <laughs> because to him, there were weeds, because that's, uh, some of them are temperate, like a Cuba, Pitosporum, stuff like that, uh, more moderately temperate. And there are lots of different zones of where your plants are native to. You've got different rainfalls, you get this distribution, variation, light intensity, cloud cover, forest cover. Um, the temperature adaptation range is anywhere from 55 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Usually an even distribution of rainfall. So when you're choosing a foliage plant mix, you need to think about the, the interior environment where the plant is going and also think about where the plant is native. Like I said, most uh, of the foliage plants we're looking at, we're primarily uh, interested in the foliage, but there's a lot of them that we're looking at for their, um, their flowers as well. Aphalandra, Spathophyllum, Bromeliads, Christmas Cactus, lots of others um, are very common uh, where we're looking at it for their foliage, uh, their flowers as well. So how did the foliage industry begin? It goes back a pretty good ways. Um, Primarily during the aristocracy of France, uh, 16th and 17th centuries, we uh, the the elite staff, the elite status would would have these orangeries or conservatories in the 17th century, and by the 18th century, there was over 5,000 species that had been brought into Europe out of the tropical regions. It wasn't until about the 19th century that that we had a foliage industry at all in the United States, and it was primarily on private estates and conservatories. And I'll show you some of those conservatories here in a minute. Like right now. <laughs> Longwood Gardens. This is the orangery at Longwood Gardens. How many have been to Longwood Gardens? Any of you? Okay. It's outside of Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. If you make a trip to Philadelphia, this is definitely a place you should go and spend some time. It doesn't matter what time of year you go or what the weather's like. It's beautiful. But they have these interior displays in this. This is their original orangery. It was established by Pierre S. DuPont and it's the DuPont estate, and he has since donated, the DuPont family has since donated the estate and created Longwood Gardens. And so this inside, this orangery is all turf and, and rotating displays, uh, as you can see. Now most of the growth of the, floor of the foliage industry in the United States has really come about since World War II. And the majority of that growth has been uh, in production is Florida and California. And what's driven that production is the ability to do uh, protected shipping in uh, climate control trucks, refrigerated trucks. So the major center is in San Diego County, uh, very southern tip of the state. Um, a lot of those growers were growing cut flowers. They moved into foliage, transitioned into foliage industry to support. Uh, other cut flower growers moved into um, bench grafting or converted their, their uh, cut flower greenhouse operations into poultry farms and now those poultry farms are closing and they're converting back into greenhouses. And the majority of the market in California is working with chain markets, shipping to box stores. And Midwest and California, um, the California market doesn't ship much over the continental divide because of the Florida and Texas uh, keep the price down. The industry in central Florida originated in the Apopka region. Where's Apopka? South, uh, a little bit north of Orlando, right? Okay. And the Apopka region actually started with the production of Boston ferns, Nephrolepsis. And they were starting to grow uh, uh, the Boston fern out of doors, um, and then eventually in the moved closer to Orlando area of 1912 and um, but I mean originally in the Orlando area in 1912 then moved to Apopka in the in 1917 and um, that was the the foundation of the Florida flo foliage industry was primarily working with Boston ferns then they started growing uh, philodendron uh, later in the 30s and migrated to the San Severia the ficus lines that we see today and what really drove the uh, industry even greater was a major freeze in the 1940s and another free, several freezes since then that pretty much destroyed the citrus industry 
in the area of Florida north of Orlando, okay? You don't see many citrus orchards north of Orlando anymore. So at that point, they started building commercial greenhouses, uh, lath frames, poly houses. Um, most of the foliage greenhouse operations I've seen are pretty much uh, uh, two by four structures with saran cloth built over them. I mean, it's, they're pretty, pretty low tech. And in the 60s and 70s is where we started seeing a lot more controlled environment. The industry in South Florida, the homestead area, um, they don't have a lot of killing frosts down there. That's the, in the Everglades. They do have killing frosts in homestead. And so most of that production was outdoors, uh, looking, growing large plants for interior scaping. Uh, there's a major area along the, the Gulf Coast, including um, uh, Alabama, uh, Mississippi and um, Louisiana, where they've got a large uh, Gulf Coast area foliage production. And in Texas, it's primarily the Rio Grande Valley down towards McAllen. And that production down there didn't start until World War II. Um, there's a large avocado industry down there. There's a large citrus industry as well down in that part of the state. But um, it all pretty much was founded around um, foliage. So foliage plants, um, I, I'm not going to talk about many specific species because there's literally thousands, but um, it's taught, uh, propagation is everything from cuttings primarily, uh, a lot of seed production, Norfolk Island pine, a lot of our philodendrons we do seed production, uh, air layers is common, division is common, and spores amongst the fern populations. Um, cuttings is probably the most common. Seed production. We see a lot of seed production to get away from seed uh, disease transmission. Most of our tropical uh, foliage plants have fleshy seed and they're not as easy to handle. They don't store well. They have lots of fats, lots of oils. So um, the fleshy pulp has to be removed. Um, oftentimes if you leave that fleshy pulp on, on the philodendron seeds and some of these, they will actually ferment and sour. So we have to do a maceration process to take uh, the flesh off. Um, as soon as the tropical foliage seed, they have very low shelf life. They have to be germinated and propagated right away. So those that are marketing and, and working with seed produced cultivars actually typically have their own stock blocks. Um, ger knowing the germination requirements for a lot of these tropical species is, uh, a lot of these guys are magicians. Um, to get these seeds to germinate. Um, typically poor handling, palm seeds, easy to germinate. They're inch deep. Philodendron, aglaonema, a quarter of an inch, Norfolk Island pine. It's actually a fairly large seed, but we lay it on the surface and, and use a mist system to get that, that seedling to germinate. Um, cuttings, anything from tip, single eye, double eye, leaf, cane cuttings, most common. You've covered all of this in plant propagation class. Um, people that are doing cutting propagation typically uh, maintain their own stock blocks, um, maintain uh, clean, turgid disease, insect free. Um, if you're using uh, PGRs, and, and a lot of our tropical plants are grown in nurseries outdoors, so they're using herbicides, so you want to make sure you do your cutting propagation at least two months after you've done a herbicide application, because many of the herbicides that they're using in nurseries that grow um, Foliage plants are dinitroaniline herbicides like uh, surflan or treflan, which are meristematic poisons. They kill the growing tip. So um, you want to maintain as much leaf area for, to give yourself some photosynthates. And of course, we use intermittent mist a lot. So some common cuttings, uh, tip cuttings, uh, dracaena, where we're using a growing tip, uh, aglaonema, peperomia, uh, these produce good quality plants in a short time. It's more expensive because you have fewer cuttings per pl stock plant and we're going to just stick them uh, deep enough to support the stem and, and get them to root. Leaf bud cuttings, like if you're just taking just the, uh, you need to have a piece of the a uh, axillary bud for meristematic tissue. Those are single eye, double eye. These are, works really well with our vine type uh, Vine type foliage plants like uh, the pothos and the nephthitis and stuff like that, 
where we're growing hanging baskets or something like that. Leaf cuttings, that's what we work with with African violets, uh, some of the Rex begonia lines. Um, this is, you can get the largest number of plants from your stock material because you're only using leaves, but you have to be of the ability to de-differentiate and generate an apical meristem. For instance, I can get a rubber plant leaf to root, but I can't get a rubber plant leaf petiole cutting to grow a new plant. It will root, it will survive, it'll be perfectly healthy, but since a rubber, rubber plant, Ficus elastica, does not have the capacity to regenerate a meristem. It'll grow roots, but it'll never regenerate a meristem. Whereas Peperomia, we can regenerate roots and it will regenerate a meristem. So you need to know which one will do and which one will not. So leaf cuttings, we get the most plant material off of a stock plant, leaf bud. Next up, tip, we're usually getting four or five nodes, so that's the least efficient. Cane cuttings, um, Cane plants like Deffenbachia, Dracaena, uh, oftentimes those canes, uh, these are monocots, so we want that intercalary meristem, and we have to have that to, to generate our new uh, cuttings. A lot of times what uh, some growers will do is they'll go into, um, uh, they'll maintain a block of, of, of Dracaena or a block of Deffenbachia in huge uh, systems and they'll just go through and they'll just clip the canes off like a hedge and then they'll resize them to get the three stands, the three poles, and let's root them and break off new plants at the same time. In fact, a lot of our Dracaena, uh, Masianja, and stuff like that, are made, we, those are harvested out of blocks of plants in Guatemala or someplace like that, and they just bring the unrooted st canes to the United States, cut the canes off, root the cane and force out new growth and they're ready to sell a plant. That's how they're grown. So we have a lot of production in Puerto Rico. Uh, we had a lot of production in Cuba until Castro came along. Um, <clears throat> and the, 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 cue, the cue is we're shipping these canes in to the United States unrooted without soil, but they, so we want to make sure that uh, we don't violate quarantine 37. Quarantine 37 was implemented in the 30, 1930s to prevent the translocation of soil-borne diseases into the United States from these countries, uh, such as uh, from Central America and other parts of the world, because you can't see if there's a contaminant in the soil. Okay, uh, so we're getting canes in from all over the all over the world. In fact, like if, you, if you've ever been to Hawaii, you've probably brought home a cigar plant, a plumeria. Plumeria is the plant that the, they make the lays, the lay flowers out. You can buy the little canes in the gift shops, right? You've seen that, so. Yeah. There's one at the uh, gardens. One at the gardens. And it's a beautiful smell. The, when the plumeria blooms, it's a beautiful smell. One of my favorite. Air layering is, is probably one of the more common things that we've done at home. Uh, works really good on the ficus species where we strip some of the uh, bark off and expose the cambial tissue, wrap it in sphagnum moss, enclose the sphagnum moss in uh, polyethylene wrap and root it. And then when it roots, we can cut uh, the stem off and we have a new plant. Of course, this isn't a very efficient use of uh, propagation material because it, it, it it uh, t takes a lot of space. But for instance, there, there are uh, foliage plant farms down in southern Florida where they've got ficus trees growing in nurseries, in nursery blocks, acres and acres and acres. And this is all they do is just do air layering and come and cut it off, put it in a pot, and sell it. So it works very efficiently for them. Division, we use a lot of division on plants that are chimera. What's a chimera? Anybody remember what a chimera is from plant propagation? We have two different plants growing together as one. Common one is Sansevieria, where we have a variegated and a dark green growing together. So those, if we just root those, the chimera separates, but if we also do it through division or ferns, um, very common. Spore germ germination is probably the most common, where we germinate the, the spores from the fronds. Do they, does Dr. Hughes germinate spores for you? In plant prop? No? Okay. 
if we, when I show you the pictures of Lady Gaga, that, you know, because um, the Lady Gaga fern, it's actually the, the diploid stage because the mature fern that we see is actually the haploid stage, the non-sexual stage. Um, now, a lot of, tish, a lot of um, foliage growers do a lot of their propagation with tissue culture. Tissue culture because it's the most efficient production and use of plant materials. And this is actually in a um, foliage plant tissue culture lab outside of Apopka where they're doing aseptic culture and they're doing all their propagation in an air-conditioned room uh, with in, in hoods and they're all pathogen index free and it works really well for um, hard to root species. And so the, the tissue culture people, they're doing their transplants here and doing their, their cultures and then um, la at a later stage in another, in another room, they will be doing their um, transplant into their, their starter packs. This is all working in, in a climate very more, much more comfortable than the greenhouse loading them up on their monorails and the monorails move out into the greenhouse. So when you're choosing potting media for propagating uh, your foliage plants, foliage plants grow just about everything. You need to know the background, the species, the requirements. You can have different um, for your cacti and your, and your arid species and your tropical species. It needs to be clean, uniform, firm enough to support the cutting typically 5.5 to 6.5, water holding capacity, moderately high, lots of air space. And oftentimes, propagation of foliage plants is a long-term proposition. So you want to make sure that the rooting material doesn't degrade and shrink over time. In the past, before we used um, intermittent mist systems, propagation was done in houses with low light levels. So we didn't have to have intermittent mist, so they wouldn't stress. With intermittent mist, we can use higher light intensities and we can get the rooting to go faster because we've got higher levels of um, photos higher activity of photosynthase. Mist systems give you the best water relationships, gives us more carbohydrates, more photosynthesates. Uh, however, oftentimes the mist system will cool the, the potting soil. So the growers will often use uh, bottom heat to keep that up. And so this is actually the greenhouse uh, associated with that foliage operation, the tissue culture lab I showed you a second ago. And they move them out and they have a bottom heat system and they're just pumping warm water through this PVC pipe. They're maintaining a night temperature of 72, day temperature 77 to 95. The root temperature, um, we're trying to keep those at about 68. Um, to keep it uh, up and running. And foliage plant propagation also, is, most foliage plants will grow faster with uh, addition of CO2. Spacing of foliage plants, well, it depends on what you're growing. You want to get light in there, you want to get air circulation in there, because a lot of foliage plants are susceptible to a lot of foliar diseases, want to keep it clean. Uh, we apply fertilizer to foliage plants as soon as we see roots. In um, other crops, we wait till the roots get to the edge of the pot. Foliage plants, they're hungry because we're rooting that cutting and we need to have uh, fertilizer as soon as we can. Oftentimes, as soon as the grower sees uh, roots coming on their cuttings, they'll apply a, sol a slow release fertilizer like Osmocote or Stay Green or something like that. And of course, most foliage plants root faster with uh, rooting hormones. Now, once you get into the production mode, what you're going to use for your rooting substrate, you need to sort of think about the habitat that it came from. A lot of our, uh, especially our vining foliage plants, actually are epiphytes. An epiphyte is a tree grow plant that grows in the air, up or do, up in there. Typically, they uh, live in the crotch angle of trees and that, and that organic matter. Or then we have some in uh, the arid, they just grow in pretty heavy clay soils. And the biggest thing that we need to think about is the structure of our media. We can change the pH, we can change the fertility. You need to think about the structure. 
And the other thing you need to think about is how much does it weigh? If you're a Florida grower and you're shipping to Denver, Colorado, you're, gonna wor wor you're worried about how much is it going to cost to ship that plant. So you're going to use the lightest mix as possible, but also if it's a tall plant like a fern, a palm, tall plant like a palm or a dracaena, you actually want to have enough ballast that it stands up straight. So it's a fine line what it costs to hold the plant up. Pore space is, of course, always important as long as water holding capacity 20 to 60 percent. Most people love their foliage plants too much. Most problems that people have with house plants or plants in their house is they water them too much. If we want to uh, avoid a high nitrogen ratio, we would like to have high cation exchange capacity and a pH 5.5 to 6.5 works for most everything. Water quality is important. Most of our foliage plants are sensitive to salt, especially pl our foliage plants with lanceolate leaves like the Dracaenas, where they have fine tips and we see a lot of salt tip burn. Some plants are sensitive to fluoride in the water, and fluoride can cause some tip burn as well. So, like I said, most growers tend to use too much water and they're using too much water which it causes a lot of root rots and most of it's due to poor aeration. Most of the foliage growers I've ever worked with over water, over fertilize and use heavy crappy soil. Use good quality soil, water appropriately, fertilize appropriately, you'll be, you'll be successful. Remember, a lot of our foliage plants are going to be in this container for a long time. A lot of foliage plants last a long time. I gave away a um, plant that it was given to me. It was a um, Christmas cactus that was 45 years old. I have my great grandma's. And, and you're probably paranoid because you have your great grandmother's plant. Well, this plant was actually propagated by one of our early um, extension horticulturists in Boulder County. The woman that gave it to me was the Extension Horticulture of Boulder County. She'd get it. She actually propagated in plant propagation class in 1957 at CSU. I passed it on to somebody that actually has a sunroom and doesn't have cats that eat foliage plants. Think about what you need to do to make sure that that plant has got plenty of fertility. Post plant, we can put on some fertilizers. It's labor intensive, control release, such as that. Post plant application, some growers just use dry application with sprinklers. Most people use liquid with uh, uh, fertilizer injectors. Foliar application of foliage plants does work, but it's typically done as a fix it, a fix all for specific micronutrients. And of course, the rates are species dependent, um, light intensity. If you've got high light, you're going to increase your fertility, low light, decrease your fertility so forth and so forth. Has to do with your temperature, your production area, um, high temperatures, you're going to have rapid nutrient breakdown, low temperatures, the roots are cold. Um, and like I said, most of our growers are using primarily the cheapest fertilizers they can find and growing in the cheapest environment because foliage plants, let's face it, are cheap. So here's some other pictures I'd like to show you. Um, this is uh, Longwood Gardens Orangery and some of its highlights. Um, it's a beautiful facility. Uh, I highly recommend that you go there at some point. It is one of the Mecca centers of horticulture in the United States. It's well worth, a well worth your time. Interior scaping is uh, very common. Uh, it's high demand. Um, interior scaping with foliage plants does a lot of different things. There's a condition we call the sick building syndrome. Okay, uh, A lot of our uh, buildings have lots of um, chemicals coming out of the carpets and these sorts of things. And it's, there's tons of data out there that was generated by NASA in the 80s, in the early 1980s, that shows that 
Interior scape plants can fix the sick buildroom syndrome by providing uh, this bank of plants. Not only does it look good on this left-hand slide, not only does it look good, but it also serves as an air filter, provides some oxygen. It uh, catches a lot of the um, uh, organics in the atmosphere and cleans it out. And a lot of times, too, you'll find that people choose to sit, and they will choose to sit. Um, you can. This is a, a rock bench, and um, if you had a comfy couch sitting over here, people would choose to sit next to the plants and not sit in the comfy couch. Um, oftentimes, we'll use. Um, palms in uh, restaurants and bars and, and places where there's lots of uh, smoke or other atmospheric pollutants to provide a softer feel and a softer touch and also to improve the climate. Not only does it look good, we used to call them when I was uh, in, this, in the 70s, we used to call them fern bars. You know, that was where you went. Um, you went to the fern bar. Uh, this is a picture of the of the Opryland Hotel. I don't know what the current condition of the Opryland Hotel is. It's in Nashville. Two summers ago, the Nashville River flooded and flooded this property. And um, this is um, uh, they have these huge conservatories with glass, and uh, these are hotel rooms that open out into this whole environment. And they've got um, restaurants and shops and all kinds of stuff and you can hang out here and ride little boats through everywhere and wander through the gazebos and stuff like that and they have a full horticulture staff um, that that manages this property um, and then at the end of the day you can go to the Grand Old Opry. Here's some other pictures of, of some of those rooms um, 